ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cage Talk. Today, my guest, we have a UFC veteran. We have a 20, uh, 2010 Comeback Fighter of the Year, WEC Middleweight Champion, Gladiator, Gladiator Champion, uh, FCFF Middleweight Champion, UFCF Middleweight Champion. We have the legendary... Ultimate fi- uh, Fighter, semi finalist. We have Chris, the Crippler, leaving. How you doing, bud? Doing good, man. Thank you. You like Thanks that? For- you like that intro? You like- that was quite the intro. I think you got everything. I did, man. Uh, of course, uh, I've been following you for a long time. Love, love everything you you did in the octagon when it was in WEC. If it was Ultimate Fighter, if I mean. You, you've done everything, you know, bare knuckle. I mean, you are a true veteran for combat sports. And um, I do thank you for everything that you did, man. It, it is awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're, you're a fun fighter to watch again. You had a lethal uh, left hook. I mean, people just couldn't put you down, man. You were just, you were just a banger. And I, I do uh, appreciate it. And again, uh, welcome to the show. Again, your awards, I mean, you were the, you had fight of the night probably like two times, knockout of the night, I think four times. One of them was, one of my favorite knockouts was the, remember Terry Martin, where you were, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> and then um, you were also the first, uh, first non-title main event for five rounds you were the very first person for that so that that's pretty cool as well and again you were also in the ultimate fighter uh season season one the very first one and we'll we'll go through you know your career and stuff like that so how did you get into into fighting what was your first kind of like step where you wanted to make this a career well you know i uh you know, I did a little boxing in middle school. Mm-hmm. I wrestled through high school. And then, uh, you know, once I got out of high school, there was really no, uh, I wasn't exactly college bound, let's okay. put it that way, you know? <laughs> so, you know, and I, and I loved wrestling. I loved competing. I loved the camaraderie of the team. I loved the gym environment. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, you know, my, my brother was selling used cars. Okay. And he called called me one day and he says, Hey, Matt Linlin and Randy Couture are kicking the shit out of each other, you know, in the, in the mechanics garage at this car lot. And I would have said, what? I'll be right there. You know? So I shot down there and uh, that was team quest in the very, very beginning. You know, I think I'll, I think I was the, uh, like the 12th student ever at team quest. Okay. You know? so I was there from the very beginning and, and, uh, you know, signed, signed up that day and then, you know, never looked back. Nice. Nice. Again. Yeah. That was the beginning of team quest. Again, you ran a tour, you got Matt Lindland, big, big rest, you know, wrestling background. So that's re- that's really cool, man. That's awesome. Um, so once that happened, right. Started, started, you got into the UFC. Once you got into the UFC, how did the whole, Ultimate Fighter, because again, this was the very first time that was actually, hey, we're putting live, you know, you know fights. We're gonna put in, we're gonna follow these fighters. They're gonna be in the house. That was the very first time. So, how, how was that proposition to you, and and how did you adjust? Because again, there was some a little a little co- controversy over there in, in the Ultimate Fighter. Well, that. you know, that first season, mm-hmm. um, I mean, honestly, we didn't even know if it was ever gonna air. You know, they okay. were filming just hoping you know i think spike tv finally picked it up um you know it was a real the ufc was hemorrhaging money at the time yep and it was a real gamble for the for dana white and the Petitas. uh you know ultimately um i was all i had already been fighting for you know a few years at that point i think i had just won the wec title i had just beaten mike swick yep. met dana white for the first time and you know, I was lucky enough that my coach was uh, was Randy Tour. Okay. You know, so he kind of gave me a little nudge and said, "Hey, there's going to be this show. I think you should send a tape in for it." You know, okay. mm-hmm. um, and and 
And at that time, that first season, you know, all the people on that first season, you know, it, you know, I don't mind saying it. I think it was the best. I think it was the best. Had the most talent on it for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because you know that first season, everybody they took at one eighty five and at two hundred five were people that were already close to making it into the UFC. Gotcha. So, so all of us were already kind of knocking on the door of the UFC. Um, ultimately, you know, thanks to Randy, let me know. Said in a tape, I got it. I got an audition. And then, you know, made it on the show, um, you know, and, and the show propelled our careers. I mean, it changed the entire sport of mixed martial arts, it really did. turned UFC, turned my name into a household name, much less the UFC, you know. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty, it was pretty incredible how, how it all kind of worked out, just kind of flashbang, you know, quick. We didn't, you know, had no idea the... Uh, the effect that 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 it was going to take definitely and uh, again um regardless if that didn't take off i think your fighting your fighting style the way you you fight would definitely would have taken off because again people people love you know a brawler they they know they love knockouts you know that's what people and you know you tie in chris uh chris lieben and that's kind of almost like the very first thing they think about it's like man he was a knockout artist i mean he was hard to to take down and at the same time even when when you were hurt that was a scary that wasn't the worst thing when you were hurt you were like the most dangerous it was just like you would just wing it and again everyone everyone loved that and again i don't think there's any mma um fan out there that doesn't like chris lee you get what i'm saying like well, thank you man appreciate that you know and and i for the most part you know i i always tried to fight that way you know it was more important to go out and you know, ha have a war and lay it on the line, then, you know, to kind of chess match, you know, tiptoe out of, vi out of victory, you know? Yep. Definitely. At the time, at the time, not taking anything away from the guys of today, mm -hmm. because at the time you could get away with fighting like that. I think at the, at the highest level today, um, you know, the, the guys are such tacticians. The skill level is so yeah. high that, that, you know, you can't just go out there with, with a top 10 guy and expect to slug it out. You know, yeah, that's why, you know, we see a lot more of these quote unquote chess match type, type fights, you know? Um, and ultimately, you know, that it, it is what it is, but, but uh, you know, I think at the time for, for the fans, it was a great time uh, uh, for the sport just because of that, that entertainment value. Definitely. Uh, yeah, the, the, again, the, the game has changed. You're right. Absolutely. Um, the game has changed completely. So now you just don't get um, just a, a random person where you, they'll just stand up and brawl, unless the person's a brawler. But usually they'll have their own style that they want to Im implement on you, unfortunately. There's a couple guys that move forward, you know, and, and are extremely exciting and can pull it off at the highest level. But I think it's uh, becoming rarer. Mm hmm I agree with you completely. Now, talk about your career, man. I mean, you had some stellar knockouts. I mean, you've been, you've been, you know, smashing domes for a while. What, what was your favorite fight or uh, that you remember in in your past that that you love? That was just like maybe like a straight up street ball. I'm, I remember talking to Chris Lytle, and he was saying that his uh, Tiago Alves fight was one that he liked because he kind of he kind of lost himself in the fight. You know, he was just they were just trading and stuff, so. Right. Well, you know, and I mean, that's happened to me. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, there's the ones that people remember, like the Terry Martin, Vandalay Silva's. Uh, yeah. you know, um, those were great, you know, some other knockouts in the UFC. But my personal favorite fight was, was actually uh, an amateur fight I had okay. against a guy, a guy named Otto Olsen. He took second in Abu Dhabi, and I think he took second in uh, wrestling for Michigan in NCAA's. Tough kid, but he ends up getting, you know, he kicks the shit out of me for a round, gets me in a choke, and you can see on the video, I lift my hand to tap, but I end up passing out, you know. Oh, shit. Uh, and, and the ref is on the other side, so the ref can't see it, you know. I heard about and somehow he, like, tries to readjust the choke. I wake back up. 
pop out and like I fall across the ring because I'm basically drunk from being choked, you know, and somehow in that stumbling, knock him out, you know, and it, you know, he was the hometown favorite. It was midnight. The crowd was just loaded drunk. And then all of a sudden you just see beer bottles, and everything. <laughs> they had to sneak us out the back door afterward. Oh, wow. I mean, those kind of memories, you know, as a, you know, in my, my, you know, my early, I was 20, 21, 22 years old. You know, um, you know, and my 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 other teammates, my other Ed Herman was on that card. He Not won Ed it as well. You know, um, we all won that night, and it was just uh, just a spectacular uh, an evening. You know, it was it was huge for me. That was like winning the UFC at the time. You know Definitely. what I mean? It was winning the world title, winning that mm. that uh, little amateur belt. Definitely, man. Uh, again, um, you went it with with some legends in this cage, okay? We, I mean, we talk about Vandalay Silva. I mean, you put him, you put him on, on his ass. How, how was that fight, man? Because that was one of the ones that, again, it's two fighters that have almost the same type of style, yet it sucks, especially from a fan perspective, because I liked you guys both so much. It's kind of like you didn't want to see that happen, but you kind of did. You're like, you know, like, shit, I don't want him to get knocked out, and I don't want him to get knocked out, but they're going to fight, and the way they fight, they're good. Somebody's going to get knocked out. Yeah, you know, so it kind of sucks, but at the same time, you know, so can you can you a little bit elaborate on that? Yeah, so what happened was, uh, you know, I had asked Dana to fight Vandalay several times yeah. um, because uh, he was my hero, man. When I was an amateur – I used to, uh, you know, catch the bus across town to this Japanese toy store where the guy would rent me these bootleg pride videos, you know, and <laughs> I really tried to emulate him early on in my career and his style. I mean, his, in pride, that motherfucker was vicious, oh, you know? Was... <laughs> vicious. I thought he, I mean, I thought he killed Sot Karaba, you know. Yeah, remember? Oof. You know, um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, the answer, it was no, 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 you're not ready for him, not, you know, da, 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 you know, he's too good for you. And then um, I beat Aaron Simpson. Then they asked me to fight Akiyama uh, two weeks later, you know, and, and uh, a little victory, though, by the way. And that was because Vandalay had got, was supposed to fight Akiyama, but something happened. Vandalay got hurt, I believe. So, you know, I stepped in and took the fight. You know, and I beat Akiyama. So then I called Dana back. I said, look, man, I beat the guy you had Vandalay against. So, exactly. so, you know, and he was basically more or less like, well, fine. You know, and, and, he, and he made the fight, made the fight happen. You know, be careful what you wish for, you know. Exactly. And I think I probably never trained harder in a fight for a fight in my life because, uh, you know, fear is, is fucking motivating, man. You know. Um, you know, and I was scared to death to fight Vandalay, you know, it's one of the few fights that I went in there thinking I was going to lose, you know, really, but, but in the preparation, I, I, I trained my ass off, you know, and, uh, the exact scenario that kind of went down in the fight, which is funny, like my coach, Burton Richardson, it posted a video, um, and it's us training for that exact scenario over and over again. It worked out exactly like we thought it was going to work out. Like we had, mm -hmm. like we had drilled, never had a fight where the game plan actually worked the worked way it was <laughs> like we always plan for stuff. And then, you know, you know, you make adjustments and, and whatnot, you know, on the fly as the fight goes on. But that, that fight from, from punch one worked out exactly the way we, we had planned, you know, um, you know, Vandalay throws, he throws that, that uh, one, two hook, hook, you know, yeah. we, we knew that's what he was going to come with. I just had to get him to pull the trigger, you know? So I think I threw an inside kick just to get him to pull that trigger. And then uh, ultimately, you know, the tight clinch uppercuts, uh, you know, it worked out. It worked out. I couldn't believe it. I was more blown away that the plan actually worked, you know, <laughs> like what the fuck, like what do I do now? You know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty wild, man. It was a wild experience, you know, uh, being being in there, you know, twenty something thousand people, you know. Then you know, I get in the cage, and then all of a sudden the whole arena goes dark. They start playing, 
the Dumb. music. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's iconic, man. That 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 would give me goose. I just remember back in the day watching him in Pride and That's just, about that's about the time I started thinking, what the fuck was I thinking? You know, <laughs> like what the I'm freaking crazy, you know? Like, and I got my family here. I told everybody to tune in. What am I doing, you know? Do you do you fight better when um your family is not in the crowd or or or, or do you cuz some people find that a little bit more of a distraction? Um yeah, you know, know, it doesn't matter to me. I I always tell people they get, you know, people go people especially right now they keep asking, you know, how do you feel about, you know, the uh you know, because of Corona, there's nobody in the crowd. It must be hard to fight, run a, you know, with no people. And, I'm, you know, ultimate, ultimate Fighter, there were no people as well, you know. Exactly, yep. Uh, I've been in plenty of fights in other places where there weren't many people watching, <laughs> too, if you know what I'm saying. You know, here's the thing, man. When you're in a fight, you're not really concerned about who's spectating, right? You're yeah. concerned about not dying, you exactly. know. So, to me... I don't understand this. I get energy from the crowd or, or I, or I don't get energy from the crowd or I get, I get the big show jitters. Like, like, no man, it's, it's just self-preservation. You know, once I get hit, you know, That's it. and you know, like you said, I, I, I have a tendency to get a little more dangerous once I'm hurt. That's just because I'm like, shit, I'm hurt. I got to hurt them worse than yep. they hurt me. You know, You're like I got to, it's it it really just comes you know it's it's fight or flight you're gonna do one of two things once you're let me t- let me tell you my friend your fight or flight instinct is a hell of, it's on point I'll give you that <laughs> we've seen that so many times <laughs> but um I mean right now um after after your career in, in the UFC um you were gonna do I think you were gonna start Bellator correct and that something that didn't fall through. What happened? Yeah, so you know, I signed a contract with mm-hmm. Bellator, and then, uh, you know, I went and did my my pre fight medicals, and I, I ended up failing them because of uh, I had a heart condition, you know, which you know probably was from drinking and lifestyle, you know, I you know, for a lot of years there, my my motto was everything in excess, nothing in moderation, you know, I was fucking train hard party hard, go hard, you know, out all night, train all day, you know, and, you know, eventually, man, my ticker just couldn't take it, you know, Definitely. so, you know, went into the doctor, you know, and, you know, she, you know, my cardiologist did an echocardiogram, they let me know, hey, your, your heart is shot, you need a new one, you know, like, no way you'll ever fight again, you know, um, so, you know, some time went by, I was on a, you know, list to get a, I would get a new one and then uh, checked it again. Well, it's getting better. You know, it's getting better. Now we just need to, you don't need a new heart. We need to put a pacemaker in, you know, and, you know, ultimately what I, what I, what had to happen was I had to stop drinking completely, had to stop doing any extracurricular activities, uh, the kind that I used to take part in, I had to, uh, <laughs> I had to stop hanging out with a lot of the same people and had to, you know, change my diet, change yeah. my nutrition. You know, I did, you know, everything that you're supposed to do, you know, all the, you know, people, you know, it's heart disease is the most common uh, thing that people die from in this country, mm-hmm. you know, more than cancer, more than anything, people die from heart disease. And, you know, I, I'm a perfect example to anybody that it is reversible, you know, because, through changing everything, you know, I, I didn't get the pacemaker, you know, and uh, she let me know that I was taking a, a risk of, of dying if I didn't, but they told me I couldn't train anymore, you know, and then uh, conti- my heart just continued to get better till ultimately I was, I was cleared uh, to fight again. And, and that's when, uh, that's when I was able to uh, go back and uh sign a contract with the bkfc and, and and have a couple bare knuckle bouts yep you had again um i'm glad that everything wor- again worked out for you man uh thank you you know that that's awesome and then yeah you had uh you went to bare knuckle again uh you know had chris light on and don't mean to bring him up again but i mean he was he he loved it he loved uh doing bare knuckle and um, you had, I believe, three fights. Your very first debut was against uh, Phil Baroni, right? 
Yep, yep. That was a hell of a problem. So how, how's your preparation? Well, how, how's, um, first of all, let, let me, I'm going to too ahead of myself. So how is, bare, how did you like bare knuckle fighting? Was that like, was that something you preferred more than MMA because it was more focused on stand-up, which is more your style? And, and um, you know what, you know, uh, it's gnarly. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's gnarly. The, the locker room of that first show looked like a fucking Civil War med tent, you know. People just <laughs> back leaking blood everywhere. You know, the lacerations are incredible, you know, especially when you've got skilled fighters with no gloves, you know, um, you're going to get hit. You're in a fight. That's the bottom line. And with no gloves at all, you're going to get cut, you know. Now, as far as brain drama goes, I think maybe a little better for you. But as far as blood and gnarliness factor, you know, I think bare knuckle takes the cake, you know. Um. That being said, it was really cool to be part of those first bare knuckle shows because I really felt like, you know, the old days of UFC, like, like almost like this shit's borderline illegal, you're doing something kind of wrong, you know, and, and, you know, to, to, you know, the sport was so big at one time, you know, and, and, you know, it was gone for a hundred years to be part of that resurgence and, and, you know, as Bare Knuckle continues to have events, the BKFC is growing, getting bigger and better every event, you know, for forever, I'll be able to say, you know, I was, I was there in the beginning, you know Definitely. what I mean? I Definitely. was part of that, you know, and, and, and as a martial artist, um, you know, the training for it is cool because you know what, if you get yourself in a sticky situation, you get in a fight, you're probably not going to have time to throw on gloves. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you what, the difference between, uh, and any fighter will tell you this, the difference between a boxing glove and an MMA glove is huge. What you can do, what you can't do. The difference between an MMA glove and no glove at all is even bigger. You know, there's no, there's no riding punches. There's no covering. Everything is going to, if you get hit by it, it's going to hurt, you know? So, um, you, you got to catch everything, you know, and I really enjoyed, you know, training uh, for that man or a fight because when it comes to martial arts, I'm, I'm, I, I consider myself a purist, you know, I believe in as, as few rules and regulations as possible and mm-hmm. keep, you know, and keep the fighters safe, you know, um, and so it was neat to, uh, to test the waters there and try that out and see how, uh, you, you know, you know what I mean? See how yeah, my definitely. skills were applicable see what skills were applicable and what skills were not applicable well yeah man those are um i mean you're talking about ufc gloves were four ounces where you know you can actually block something compared to a bare knuckle where that shit's gonna slide right in that's you're gonna get popped you know like it's that's right right and you can wing it you can wing a shot with with a hand wrap yeah and and a ufc glove they're they're four ounces they're pretty dense though you know Mm-hmm. And, and shit, I broke my hand half the time in UFC gloves, you yeah. know, so no gloves at all. You've got to, you got to really focus on how you throw your punches, where you place them. Mm-hmm. And the range is different. You know, that it's a, you know, there's a good, a, a UFC glove is a good inch, inch and a half thick. Okay. You know, boxing glove is probably four inches thick. Mm-hmm. Add four inches on it each, each hand on your reach. That's substantial. Yep, that's so a big difference. Your your range, that one, you know, when you train, you hit mitts every day, and you spar every day, your range gets tuned in, you know, especially at the higher level, gets tuned into, you know, millimeters, you know, where you understand what, what you're going to hit them with, what you're not going to hit them with. Yeah. That all changes when you have no glove and no hand wrap on. You know, yeah. it's a different, you got to get a little closer. You know, so that and that takes some uh, some time to develop. Yep, especially um, as fans, a lot of fans, I, a lot of fans wouldn't know that. You know, unless they they've done it before, or they're you know into uh, combat sports for a long time. But even that, I mean, again, that's that's really good uh, information because I, I really didn't even think about the the reach with uh, with all the wraps and stuff like that. But it makes yeah. I mean, it makes sense, man. It does make sense. But um, uh, what was I gonna say? But after bare knuckle fighting, right? You had three fights. Um, 
after that you went, like I talked to Frank Trigg and now you're doing some, some referee, man. Yeah. So referee I've been doing, I actually, I took a, I did Herb Dean's course, yep. you know, um, incredibly difficult, great course. Both Herb Dean and Big Don are, uh, <laughs> and they're gnarly. They, they, the, obviously nobody knows the sport better than them. Um, you know, the, the course is so thorough. I thought being a, uh, Fighter. you know, fighting my whole life <laughs> and coaching, I, I would have no problems with it. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, maybe one other person passed. I'm not even sure about that. I may have been the only person out of my course to pass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. You know, um, Frank was telling me that. It's, uh, he's like, man, you don't understand how many fighters go in there and how many fighters fail. Like, it's crazy. Because you know, that was, like, one of my questions was, like, well, wouldn't we want more fighters just because they've been there, they know – you know exactly what's happening and he's like no actually to be honest with you it's like a whole it's another level man i you know i okay so i think there's some benefits mm -hmm. to a fighter for sure um for example i think um the self-control you know not letting your adrenaline get out when a guy gets hurt to still yep. be poised you know fighters have that they're they're, they're we're a little bit more used to the trauma and whatnot being right next to it Definitely. Um, i think also when it comes to reading an athlete you know having you know you need to know when that fighter wants out Definitely. you need to know when they when they quit um because repping really isn't cut and dry you know what i mean like mm -hmm. like you know it seems like every show we're we're, we're, we're having this debate over whether a fight should have been stopped or oh, not been stopped. Yeah. you know I mean, there, there's some, there's some um, subjective things, you know, when it comes to stopping a fight, for example, you know, I, I think that there's a, a level of intuitiveness that comes with having been in there, you know, exactly. multiple times. That being said, just as not all who do can coach, you know, and not all who coach can do, you know, it, it is a different hat. Yeah. Not everybody that's a great fighter is going to make a great referee. You're right. It, it's a it's a very different set of skills, and uh, and that's something that, that that I had to that I had to learn. You know, mm -hmm. I really thought it was going to be easy. And I remember my first match that I refereed. Man, I was like, how did, how did that go? You know, when you're getting punched, you don't have time to worry about safety and everything else. When you're the referee, that's your job. Yep, that's all you know, I do. You know, you stop a fight too early. Maybe you robbed a, a fighter of his opportunity. You stop a fight too late. Maybe you robbed a fighter of a longer career. That's and true, man. Their health, you know. So it is. It's intense. It's intense. I love it. I I love it, um, and I I take it very seriously. I, I you know it it it's uh. I think I you know I hold the refs in in, in high regard now, mm -hmm. high regard. You know, after having done it on the amateur level, you know, um, yeah. What's your uh, your final goal? You want you want to be uh, eventually um, get into the the bigger pay the not the bigger pay but like the bigger events like UFC. Is that where your your uh, your initial goal is to eventually um, do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, not, not just the UFC, Bellator, LFA, all, all the, you know, those high level shows, you know, I, I want to, uh, I want to have a career uh, as a referee, you know, my, my, co my combat combatives career may be, may be over, but my career in martial arts is not, you know, and, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, it, 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 should be you know a, a natural evolution for a fighter you know to to move on to uh something else you know in, in in the sport and grow and and give back to the sport in that way you know those I skills think... i've learned over the years and be able to you know um for me you know judge coach referee i think i think you're right i think that would be probably one of the best things especially after your fighting career either you do ufc comment uh not even ufc but commentary uh on uh on the fights or a judge or a i think that's i think that's the right step 
towards everything, just almost like the NFL. You see all these NFL analysts, you know, after they're done with uh, football and they go on to Fox sports and they're talking about the, I mean, I think that's, I think that's our, should be the goal. Like, right. Right. And I enjoy, you know, I enjoy the refereeing, you know, a lot of people like, you know, like the commentary, you know, more, more power to them. Um, I, I would much rather, you know, be giving back to the sport in the way of, you know, being in there with the fighters, with, you know, taking care of fighter safety, Definitely. you know, you know re regulations. And, 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 and so that's, that's, you know, that's where my, uh, that's where my heart is, you Definitely. know, you know, like so I, I really i really enjoy it and i want to continue to do it uh indefinitely definitely man and just keep it up man that that's awesome again like you said there's there's some people that are, are made uh that can be coaches i mean that are you're good fighters but can't be coaches and some coaches that are good coaches but can't be fighters i think the same thing goes for refereeing for uh commentary i mean I, I think I, every time Dan Hardy, maybe if you like him, I'm sorry. But every time Dan Hardy talks, like when his comment, I was just like, it, my ears are bleeding. That's just <laughs> like, Frank, Frank Mir is awesome. I love when Frank Mir, he's just, he's just smooth about it. Like you can tell he's really comfortable with talking about the fight and he's easier to listen to. But again, um, that was just my take. Sorry. I just wanted to just throw Dan Hardy there. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> uh, again, man, uh, I do appreciate you, uh, everything you're doing for the sport. That That's awesome. and and. We'll see you soon, man. We'll see you definitely um, in um, in the UFC, and uh, that'll be really, really cool. And but again, yeah. uh, thank you so much for for giving your your sweat, blood, and tears in the octagon. I mean, or in the ring. I mean, you are a fan favorite. You're one of my favorites. Uh, loved watching you. Support you all the way. Still watch your fights. And um, thank you so much for everything, man. You you are the MMA legend, man. You, you yeah, I, I appreciate that, man. If I could just, if I could just say, uh, yeah, don't you know, anybody, anybody out there that, that's listening, you know, if they're uh, they want to get some training in, they're in San Diego. There we come go. Hit, you know, hit me up. Uh, send me a, you know, Instagram is the easiest way to uh, to get a hold of me. I think Chris Lieben uh, MMA is my is my handle. Uh -huh. um, you know, I'm I'm here in San Diego. Right now, I'm I'm uh, I'm at the arena. I've been there for several years. Phenomenal gym, huge gym. Okay. Um, I am working now on on opening my own place. Uh, you know, the the arena guys are helping me out with it and everything else. You know, it's one of those things. You know, like I said, you grow up. You know, eventually you move out of your parents' house. You know, mm -hmm. so you know we're uh, we're in the pro process of of uh, doing that now. So stay tuned for that, and then uh, come on out to San Diego, get some training in. Definitely. And again, uh, there's a bunch of people that do watch the show. So that'll be, that'll be really good for you. I see you're repping your, your shirt, the arena. I like it. But again, uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. All right. I do appreciate it. And God bless, man, with everything you do, bro. Yeah, thanks for having me.